Uh, namaste everyone uh, welcome uh, welcome to the presentation today uh, sorry for the interruption we had some uh, link problems so today the topic is the genetic roots of indians and uh, we, are, we are going to talk about the source of uh, uh, the genetic history of indians and our speaker today is uh, dr gyaneshwar chobe ji and he is a professor at banaras hindu university varanasi and his research is focused on the peopling of south and southeast asia in general so uh, he, uh, he has also done extensive research on the covid uh, during the covid pandemic on the impact of uh, covid on the genetic uh, in the genetic field and uh, he has uh, uh, got uh, enormous press coverage for it so welcome ganeshwar ji and please go ahead yeah namaste to everyone i am very sorry for this uh, technical problem because i was not able to connect uh, properly but hope now everything is okay and we'll have a journey to understand that what is our roots and how far we are to decipher the real history of india so uh, the situation is like uh, let's uh, give a summary it's like a something like 30 to 40 minutes of talk where we will walk through the problems and this problem is not generated just yesterday this is like 100 150 years older problem and one by one we try to see what are the problems then we try to see what has been done so far and what is still to be done and what is needed to reach to the most parsimonious conclusion so first we will talk about the hypothesis by different disciplines as you know genetics is not just one discipline working in this area there is history there is archaeology there is linguistics so basically we are talking about three different disciplines and how these three disciplines are giving the origin of modern humans into south asia and then how much they are going together and how much they are differing from each other then there was initial studies based on haploid markers mitochondrial dna and y chromosome how the mitochondrial and y chromosome are telling the story then there are newcomers this is diploid markers biparental markers or autosomal markers and excellent work done by harvard university uh dr professor david rikes lab and work done by our lab and how we are differing or how we are matching with uh, harvard university's work and then there is a case study which is like again 150 years older story which we have solved now with the use of genetics and based on that we could also see the the relations of uh, dravidian are the relation of uh, indo european and this could be also solved by the methods and then there is new evidences coming from y chromosome the paternal ancestry is usually goes from y chromosome and this y chromosome can tell us a lot about our history so we would also talk and we would have some information about our y chromosomal history so if we looks for the archaeological work there are few archaeological work which shows that human has first migrated and the modern human were also present into the south asia before 74000 years ago whereas if we look genetics genetics says that the first out of africa migration has happened something like 40 to 60000 years ago and this is the based on mitochondrial dna in the mitochondrial dna they are in situ they are autochthonous to india and most of the scientists working in this area they have accepted that a large number of mitochondrial dna more than 90% of mitochondrial ancestry of india is autochthonous which has been originated itself into the subcontinent and third one comes to the linguistic the linguistic information says that none of the language group which is being spoken in india presently is originated in india all of them has come from outside for example the austroasiatic language family the austroasiatic language family came from southeast asia 
Dravidian language family. Many of the linguists now they accept that Dravidian language family is autochthonous, but still there is a huge debate that this Dravidian language family has been originated into Mesopotamia, presently Iran, and then uh, the Dravidian migrated migrated to to South Asia. Then Indo-European language family. The most debate is going on with the Indo-European language family that it has come from the steppe belt region, and probably some of the genetic markers and the genetic uh, and the people working on genetic studies they have corroborated this this uh, kind of uh, association. So why these three different disciplines working into different region working? The, there are three different scenarios. One is that the modern human were present before 74,000 years ago in India. And this comes from the archeological work, fantastic work done by Michael Petraglia and his team. They have found out that in South Asia, there was in Karnataka, there is a Jeru Valley. And this valley has, there is a Toba eruption which has happened uh, in Indonesia something like 74,000 years back. And it has been told that the modern human, they have completely wiped out because of the Mount Ova eruption. But they have found out that uh, this group and the group of modern humans, they have lived before and after 74,000 years. And they say that modern human, they were present in South Asia from a longer time than 60,000 years back. Now, if you see genetics, next slide, please. Next slide, please. The slide is, yeah. So, and the genetic says, the genetic scenario says that approximately 40 to 60,000 years ago, there was an out of Africa migration and modern human, they have migrated to South Asia. And this comes mainly based on the mitochondrial DNA data. The mitochondrial DNA data suggests that the most of the mitochondrial ancestry of South Asian is autochthonous. That is, that has been originated 40 to 60,000 years back. and most of the maternal ancestry is indigenous to South Asia. And if we see the next slide, the next slide, the third scenario is based on linguistics. Next slide, please. So in linguistics, there are different language groups and these language groups, they have origin outside of India. The linguistics usually suggest that the Austroasiatics, they came from Southeast Asia to South Asia, something like five to 7,000 years back. The Dravidian language family, which has come from Mesopotamia to South Asia, and the Indo-European language family, which everyone knows that they that many of them suggest that it has step origin, step belt origin. But uh, there are some strong points which has come recently in a couple of years back that the Dravidian language family is indigenous and that has been originated into South Asia. So next slide, please. So we use genetics, genetics as a tool to understand the human migration. We have around 37.2 trillion cells every human has. And this cells has nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA. So my, after if we study mitochondrial DNA, the mitochondrial DNA is, as we know that it is maternally transmitted, the maternal ancestry of a person is being decided by the mitochondrial DNA. And the autosomes, which is present into, which is also called as nuclear DNA into the nucleus, and these are like 22 pairs of autosomes. One pair comes from father, one pair, other pair comes from mother. And there are sex chromosome, X and Y, female has XX and male has X and Y. So by studying these kind of chromosomes, 
their DNA structure, you able to know the ancestry of an individual. And in most of the cases, we use all the three marker system, the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA, and the autosomes. Next slide, please. And if we look to the inheritance pattern, as you can see, there are gray colors in both of the sites. One is the green color female line that is called the mitochondrial DNA moves from a female. So one could go back, 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 back to several thousand years in the ancestry and would be able to know the female, the, the, the maternal ancestry of an individual. And if we go to the, if we look to the right side, the right side is male line, the Y chromosome. If we go back in different uh, generations, so here we see that a person share their Y chromosome with their father, grandfather, great grandfather, great great grandfather, so from so on. So these like Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA, they are very straightforward. There is no recombination and easily we could able to track the maternal or paternal ancestry of an individual. But what about the gray colored people? Because if we are studying the mitochondrial DNA, you would be able to know the people who are in green color, their ancestry. But the gray color people's ancestry would be impossible to know by this method. Again, the male line, the Y chromosomal study would tell the blue color people, but the gray color people would be still impossible to know. Next slide. So then third system is the autosomal system the biparental system which we receive from both mitochondrial and uh, both from mother and father. So if we look back in our ancestry, we see that the, the closer relatives, they share the larger chunk of DNA, the larger segment of the DNA. And if we go further into the generation, we, the, the DNA length size getting smaller. And this is called as identity by recent. And, but this way we, would be able to know about everyone, like the gray colored one and the, uh, the green color one and the blue color one. But here the DNA is not coming intact for the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA, the DNA comes intact, the full DNA. But here, as we go back, the DNA reduces by 50%. So this is a complicated method, but still it tells all about our history much better than female line or male line. Next slide, please. So by using the, these methods, we generate the haplotypes. So these haplotypes usually comes from by sequencing the samples and these sequencing samples provide us different haplotypes. And these haplotypes, the group of haplotypes is called haplogroups. One haplogroup has certain kind of mutation, like if I have written haplogroup YY, it means a certain kind of mutation several individual is having, they have been, they will be grouped into a haplogroup. And if certain type kind of individual has as another, another type of mutation, they have been grouped into haplogroup XX. And by using this information, we make the trees and these trees has, if they have longer length, it means there is more diversity accumulation. It means it has taken more time for the, for the, for the whole progeny to get the, uh, to accumulate the mutation. So that's why we have large number of branch lengths, more time of mutation. Whereas on the, on the right side, we see a smaller tree. It means that it has smaller coalescent time. It has originated very recently comparing to the left side of tree. And it has, uh, uh, because the tree is smaller, it has got less time to accumulate the mutation. So this is like some basic fundamental way we use to differentiate our uh, samples and to generate the data which we could uh, use for, the, for our analysis. So in next slide, we see that there is like two different scenarios. One is demic diffusion, another one is cultural diffusion. Next slide, please. So in demic diffusion and in cultural diffusion, as we see that in India, there are several caste groups and these caste groups, they are actually shared with cult culturally with each other. They share the culture, but they don't share the genes. Whereas in demic diffusion, it has happened several times in Europe, 
and also in few cases of India, where you see that genes as well as languages, they introduce at a certain time, like time T0 says that there are two groups. One group has having different kind of genes with different language. Another group has different genes and different languages. When these two group interact or when the migration happens, then genes and languages of a certain group changes completely. So it means that this is a demic diffusion where there is a movement of genes as well as language. And in next part, you see that there is a cultural diffusion. In cultural diffusion, the only language changes. One group changes the language to another group. And this group just changes their language without changing the gene. One of the example is North Indian population called Mushar. These Mushar, they have, next slide please. Uh, these Mushar, they have changed their genes. They have changed their language, not the genes. And these language, we see that they were speaking Austroasiatic, but they have changed their language to uh, Indo-European without changing their genes. So this is how we see that there is a demic diffusion or cultural diffusion. And in different parts of India, both of them has been taken place. So in next slide, we see the demography of India and there are more than even 10,000 ethnic groups in India, more than 500 are tribes, 36 are still practicing hunting gathering. And there are diversity as we all know that the languages are different. So, so structure are different. And in India, there is a very good saying, which says that the coast, coast pe pani badle team, coast pe bani. So every one, 1.5 kilometers, the water changes and every 4.5 kilometers language changes. So this is how India is diverse, but not only language, there are social structure, there is dress and food habit, which is different into different regions of India. There are marriage practices. There is phenotype, physical appearance, as you can easily differentiate people north from south, east from west, and so on. And there is also genetic architecture, which also varies in a similar fashion. So we use genetic architecture information as a basic background information, and then use other information just, to, just for the comparison. So in uh, next slide, uh, we know that there are some common facts, just like uh, let's say 20 years back, these are the facts which has been uh, established mostly by the, the Indologist, the archeologist. And here we see that these facts are now mostly myth. Like, they say that the earliest occupation of the subcontinent was by Austroasiatic people, something like 60,000 years ago. And they were dispersed and driven into smaller pockets with the arrival of Dravidian speakers. Dravidian speaker, they came from Iran something like 5,000 years back. And again, the Indo-Aryans came something like 1,500 BC, that's like 3,500 years back. And again, they have uh, uh, switched, they have uh, shifted Dravidian to the southern part of India. But these are completely a, these are completely a myth. There is no correct, correct statement which we should accept now. Now, by using the genetic data, we would explain that how these common facts which has been uh, taught to our universities, to our colleges, and uh, that we are studying since several, at least the time uh, when the, there, were, uh, uh, there were colonial time. But if we discuss the genetics, how the genetics has changed this scenario, and let's see one by one how it has been changed to, 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 the, to the different scenarios. And they, these scenarios are much better way explaining the peopling of South Asia. So in next slide, uh, we look to the Indian gene pool. And Indian gene pool is like, as we know that Africans are much more older than any modern human population. So African have their distinct gene pool. Then in mitochondrial DNA in the upper pan, 
we see that there is M and R U. These are the major haplogroups which has been uh, which has been given rise to the non-African gene pool. And here we see that India, the green color one, has a very unique pattern. Many of the haplogroups they are very unique to India. Then there are several R groups. Then there are several U groups. So India has very unique pattern of their haplogroup haplogroup uh, system for the mitochondrial DNA. And most of the mitochondrial DNA of India is originated within India, and they are autochthonous. But in Y chromosome, into the lower picture, we see again the Africa is consistently showing the very deep rooting lineages, which has present only in Africa. But India, if we see that there are few real Indian lineages like haplogroup H, haplogroup C5, and some others, but there are some shared haplogroup which are present into India. One is O2A, which is more prevalent into East Asia. And then there are highly frequent haplogroup called R1A that is also present into India, little amount in East Asia, more in Central Asia, and also a little amount into Europe. So then based on this, several studies has been performed. And in next slide, we will see that how these haplogroups, they have given rise to the Indian population. So in next slide, please change the next slide. So the Indian ancestry, which is shared with European population is also quite deep. In the previous slide, you have seen that there is a haplogroup H14 and this haplogroup H14 is more than 20,000 years older. So there is no recent interaction even for the shared haplogroups for the mitochondrial DNA. So overall, if we look to the maternal ancestry of South Asian population, we see three different components. One, the blue color component is West Eurasian component, which is mostly prevalent into West Eurasia. But if you see that it is marginal into the South Asia, in more part of the Pakistan in Central Asia, but not to the mainland into the major part of India is mainly having the green colored one, the green colored that is autochthonous South Asian gene pool, the mitochondrial ancestry, which is present into only into South Asia and some parts of out of the South Asia. So, and the third ancestry component is present into the, uh, into the Eastern side, into the Himalayan fringes, into the, Northeastern North population. So these population is having the East Asian related ancestry, which is because of the interaction with this population and also some migration, which has happened from, from, from uh, Southeast Asia or East Asia to mainland India. So to the next slide, let us uh, see that how the several studies which has been done and mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome paint a picture on the peopling of South Asia. So these are the work which has been done before 2009. And this work clearly says, the first work which has been done by Kiwi Seald and others, it says that the earliest settlers, earliest settler means the first people of India, they persist both in caste and tribal population. This was done by, by Kiwi Seald and group. And this they have used the mitochondrial DNA Y chromosomal marker based on that they showed that both of the deep rooted lineages are shared between caste and tribal population. So based on that, they said that persist both tribal and caste population. But uh, against to this paper, there was another paper in next year, which says that Indian caste and tribal paternal lineages, the Y chromosomal lineages, they are different. The caste group has several paternal lineages which are not present into tribal group and vice versa. Then in uh, 2004, Metz Palu and others have used the mitochondrial DNA, large number of uh, mitochondrial DNA from all over the India. And they have found out that the initial maternal ancestry of South Asia, which has not been replaced, but rather has been reshaped by major demographic episode. And this demographic episode are in situ, not from outside, not from the demographic uh, pressure from outside of the subcontinent, but just by the inside relative uh, migrations which has happened. 
and there is a minor gene flow both from west and east during the recent history and the y chromosomal study there were two very prominent studies which has been done by sahu and sen gupta et al and they have found out there is no large influx coming to south asia in recent time so they both studies have rejected any rn invasion uh, any rn invasion or any rn migration which has happened in last 4000 years they said that already the indian population the haplogroup which is present into modern indian population it has been already shaped into 10000 years back during the holocene and so there is no very large influx from any other direction to the subcontinent so then in 2009 there was a landmark study by harvard next slide please so what they have done in this study and they subsequently did one one by one one by one several studies and in the first study where they said that reconstructing indian population history there they have found that indian population has been divided into ancestral north indian and ancestral south indian two major kind of ancestries and these two major ancestries carry all the indian population there is a cline between europe and to the east asia and these indian population they fit in this cline and the onge population the andaman onge population they are more closely related to ancestral south indian and the european population or central asian population they are more related to north indian population but they have removed the tibeto burman and austro asiatic population because that was not fitting in this cline so they were not able to explain their ancestry or their origin then in the next study they have done and there they tried to find out that when this ani and asi ancestry got separated so they found out that there was a very strict mixture of this group which has happened around 4200 years back to 1900 these groups were mixing a lot so it means that up to 1900 years ago there was no very strict kind of endogamy practices everybody everyone was marrying with each other and then suddenly there was a, a, a marriage practices uh, barrier and this is how the indian population has separated into two groups but there are several problems in these studies that we would explain further so in the next slide please they have done again further study in 2019 the narsimhan et al in 2019 they have uh, explained that there are two ancestries the ani and asi ancestry has relation with the different groups and here they have used the indus periphery samples that they showed that they have connection with the indus population so indus periphery sample has a more closely related ancestry that is iranian related ancestry and there is a yamnaya related ancestry which forms these two ancestry forms the ani like ancestry and there is asi ancestry and this asi ancestry is formed mainly by uh, the south asian hunter gatherers and there is little indus periphery periphery uh ancestry so this is how they have explained the overall south asian ancestry which fits into three different kind of ancestries number one ancestry is ancestral south asian hunting gathering ancestry number two is indus periphery that is indus ancestry and number three the yamnaya ancestry so these three ancestries form the ani and asi component which was which is present among almost all of the indian population but here they have showed that yamnaya population has the step belt population has contributed something like 53% which in the in their next paper they have showed that this is wrong there was maximum ancestry of yamnaya people was up to 30% and that was present into some of the population of northern india so next so in the next uh, figure we could clearly see that there is the first in the top picture we see that there is a first migration which has happened 60000 years back out of africa then 
and there are Iranian farmer related ancestry which mixes with the ancestral uh, South Asian ancestries which is also known as South Asian hunting gathering ancestry and then they form finally the Indian climb that is between ANI and ASI. But in the next slide, the same group have analyzed the, 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 the ancient sample from the, uh, from the Indus Valley region. Next slide, please. So in Indus Valley region, then they modeled and they said that the most importantly on the top, if we see that lineage is split, and they said that Iranian hunting gathering ancestry has already separated from Indus Valley civilization ancestry, something like more than 10,000 years BC. It means 12,000 years back, this ancestry was diverged and there was no admixture between Iranian and Indus Valley ancestry in the last 12,000 years. What it means? It means that before that, it has been told that most of the South Asian ancestry has been imported from Iran. But here he says that before 10,000 BC, there was interaction between these population, but after that, the South Asian population got separated and they had their own ancestry component, which is more related with Indus Valley civilization prime. So in this Indus Valley civilization climb, uh, the, the population which was living on agriculture, they have done their indigenous agriculture, uh, uh, indigenous agriculture uh, discovery. So these, uh, the agriculture practices in India is largely indigenous, which has been originated into different region of India. So then we come to the, our couple of studies in the next slide. There, we have uh, found out that the population of India, they are more related with their geography. If we put the North Indian sample, they cluster together. If we put South Indian sample, they cluster together. But they are more related with their geographical origin, not with their, uh, their language group or any other factor. So most of the Indian population, they follow the geographical climb and their geographical climb differs from north to south. So next one, in the next slide, we see that there are two components. One is dark green, another is light green, which is present among all of the population of South Asia, except the Austroasiatic people. Austroasiatic has around 30% of the ancestry, which is present only into the Austroasiatic people. And these 30% ancestry relate them with the East Asian population. So in the next slide, we see that the major two components, so one is light green, another is dark green. The light green component, if you remember the mitochondrial DNA ancestry, the West Eurasian related ancestry, we see a very similar pattern here. The, they, they follow the same pattern, uh, but there is also an, uh, the dark green ancestry, which is mainly present into South Asia and to the neighboring regions. So in the next slide, please. So the haplotype diversity of these two components, light green, that we can also call it ancestral North Indian, uh, uh, the dark green, we can call it ancestral South Indian. So we have also shown before them, before the, the work by Harvard, that the ANI component, which is present into South Asia, Central Asia, Caucasus and Iran, and also in Europe, it has highest diversity into the South Asia. And these all the regional differentiation has been occurred more than 12,500 years ago. So it means the, the ancestry which is shared between South Asia, Central Asia, Caucasus, Iranians, Europeans, Middle Eastern, they have been separated already more than 12, 1,500 years back. And the ASI ancestry, as you all know, it has originated into South Asia. And within South Asia, it has possibly originated into the Southern India because Southern India has highest haplotype diversity and haplotype diversity correlates well with the origin of a population or origin of a, uh, of a component. 
genetic component. So in the next slide, when we have plotted the Indian population with the other world population, here you can see the Pakistani population are dispersed several places to the, even in, on the top you see, even in the bottom you see Pakistani population, but Indian population you see there is a single branch and all of the Indian population are lying on this single branch. What does it mean? It means that the Indian population, they have a common ancestry and this common ancestry has not been erased since our initial peopling. It means everyone who is, uh, who is a, who has Indian ancestry, they have connected with a thread, that DNA that bind us, all of us together. Whereas if we look any other population except of Recons, we see that they have several groups and these groups are dispersed everywhere to the tree, whereas the Indian population, they form a close cluster and these cluster are only present into the India. So in the next slide, we have also done a work on the modern population of Indus Valley region. And the Indus Valley region population, they also had the same the dark green and light green components, but there are few population like Roar and, and, and the Gujars, these populations, they share a high drift, high uh, allele sharing with the, uh, with the East Eurasian population. Next, please. West Eurasian population, sorry. So if we look to the admixture of these uh, populations, we see that the rural Kambo, Jad, Khatri, Gujar, Gujaratis, UP Brahmins, Kshatriya, and Pathan. There are few population, for example, rural. You see the European related ancestry, the red color ancestry is present into rural, but in Kampo, Kamboj, it's very less. In Jat, again, it's very similar to the rural. Otherwise, they, are, they have Indian related, Indo European ancestry, and this ancestry is also more related with the Indus Valley population. So the population of India is mostly having Indian related ancestry with the minor inputs from other world population. But if we look to the rural population, we see that the 50 generations ago, it has received the European related ancestry, something like 500 AD, something like 1500 years back. So if there is any input from the West Eurasia, then it has happened very recently, something like 1500 years back or something like more than 12,500 years back. But in the between this time, we don't see any serious or severe uh, influx from the West Eurasia. Next, please. So here we take one case study because uh, the Austroasiatic people, it has been shown several times by the colonial uh, archaeologist, colonial uh, uh, Indologist, that these are the first settlers and they call also call them Mulnivasi, the, the first people of India is actually the Austroasiatic people. We have studied their genomic ancestry and by studying this genomic ancestry, we found something else. So let us have this information. So next slide, please. So let us have a background of Austroasiatic uh, language family. The Austroasiatic language family is present into the pockets. And some of the Indologists said that the Aust once upon the whole of the India was speaking Austroasiatic language family, even the Indus Valley population were speaking Austroasiatic family, but this is not true. The Austroasiatic family is more prominent, more prevalent, next slide, more prevalent to the Southeast Asia and some pockets and some groups, they were uh, present into South Asia. And here we see that there is a deep split between Munda and Khasi Aslian group. The Munda group is present mainly to South Asia, whereas the Khasi Aslian group is present into the, uh, into the Southeast Asia. So South Asia and Southeast Asia, this language group is, has been shared. And there are a few studies, next please. There are a few studies which showed that this group has migrated from Africa, the first people of India. They migrated to, next please, 60,000 years back. And then 
Later, they went to Southeast Asia. But our study has found out this was other way around. Very recently, this group has migrated from Southeast Asia, the tribal group, which is present into, the, into India. Next, please. Into India, they have been migrated from Southeast Asia to South Asia. So based on the mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome, they show a very distinct kind of ancestry. So red color represent the Southeast Asian ancestry and the green color represent South Asian ancestry. And here we see, actually the, the names are not visible here somehow. There is some problem in this slide. On the, on the, where, there, where you see the green color on the left side, this green color represent the Khasi, Dravidian, Indo-European and Austroasiatic, whereas the red color represent here the Southeast Asian related ancestry, Tibeto, Burman, Austroasiatic, Nicobaris, and other population. So on the top, you see the mitochondrial DNA ancestry of Austroasiatic, which is on the bottom, it is completely green. Green means it is associated with South Asia. On the right side, the Y chromosome, you see that more than 70% on the, 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 the down, the one, the last one, there you see that there is 70% of red color and around 30, 35% of uh, color is green color. So green color is South Asian, red color is Southeast Asian. So because of a Y chromosomal haplogroup, they show a very distinct kind of ancestry. The mitochondrial DNA ancestry shows that they are from South Asia. There is Y chromosome ancestry shows that they are, they are from Southeast Asia. So next. And based on that, we have looked to the different frequency pattern and geographical like latitude in India. And we did not find any geographical correlation of South Asian ancestry, which South Asian or East Asian ancestry which were present into the Austroasiatic people. So then we use the biparental uh, the markers, the autosomal markers among these population. And based on this, next please. Based on this, what we found out, please click next, next few times. So this is an Indian client, which we say that uh, on the left side, you see the light green and dark green. This is Indian client, uh, which is present by ENI and ASI ancestry. Then there is a circled group, and this circled group is Austroasiatic, which is present between the Indian client and between the East Asian population. The, the East Asian population is on the right side. So next, please. And there are other Austroasiatic Khasi group, and there are Southeast Asian Austroasiatic group. So it means that they have two kinds of ancestry. One is East Asian related ancestry, and another is South Asian related ancestry. Otherwise, other South Asian group like Indo-European and Dravidian, they have only, only West Eurasian and South Asian kind of ancestry, but this group has East Eurasian kind of ancestry. Next, please. So by doing this, next, please. Uh, we have done the admixture analysis, and there you clearly see that there are South Munda and North Munda groups, and they have very significant amount of the, the, the maroon color ancestry, which is more present to the East. If you see the Laos population, Cambodian population, Vietnamese population, Murud Batak, they have more than 50% of the ancestry, which is more related with the, with the, with the Southeast Asia and, and not with the South Asian population. Whereas you see the South Indian and North Indian, they largely have Indian related ancestry and also some West Eurasian related ancestry, but not with the East Eurasian related ancestry. But there are few population like Nihali and Gond. They also have the North Munda and South Munda related ancestry because they live together with them and there is some gene flow between these two population. So in the next slide, we see that there is a frequency and the variance where you see the high variance, it means that that haplogroup is originated there. So haplogroup O2A, you see a very high uh, frequency of variance, not into the India, but outside of India into the East and Southeast Asia. It means that this group, this haplogroup has originated into this region, and then they migrated to South Asia. Next, please. 
And we have also estimated the time of admixture, which was like more than 2000 to 3700 years. It means that this before 3000 or before 4000 years back, the Munda population, the Austroasiatic population has migrated from Southeast Asia to India. Then they admixed with the local population. They probably have killed the male population and married with the local female population. In the next slide, by using the Y chromosome, the, the new Y chromosome sequencing methods, uh, we could see that these haplogroups, there were some uh, dating, which is not visible also here. So this dating shows that around 5,000 years back, there was two split of this O2A group. And this Indian O2A lineage has splitted something like 5,000 years back. It means that this group was originated into Southeast Asia, something like 20,000 years back. And then 5,000 years back, there was two groups which has migrated to South Asia. Next, please. So in the next slide, we try to identify that how many groups, yeah, now you see the, the timeline. And this timeline is uh, the time of split between Southeast Asian and Indian group, whereas the Southeast Asian group is much more widespread. Next, please. So we have uh, tried to see that how many founders they have brought the Austroasiatic population to South Asia. And here you can count that there are at least minimum five different founders who have brought the, the Southeast Asian population to South Asia. The Austroasiatic people have been brought by several smaller groups. They have come to South Asia. So here the story was in the beginning the story was that these group they have come from southeast asia to south asia whereas what we study in our textbook that these are the Munlivasi, these are the group who have come to south asia something like sixty thousand years back which is completely wrong based on the recent genetic data next please so now let us talk about the, the most important uh, part of our, our uh, study, which we are close to finish. And uh, here we have done the phylogeographic study of haplogroup R1A. As you know, that many of the scientists and many of the group, they associate haplogroup R1A to the Aryan migration to India. Whereas what we have seen, what we have found out with our uh, recent data, let us uh, discuss about that. So next slide, please. In the global Y chromosomal tree, you see that every region has very distinct pattern of the Y chromosome. But some of the Y chromosome is shared between two regions. So R1A is among one of them. But before going to R1A, let us talk that how this Y chromosomal haplogroup has been dispersed to different regions. Next, please. So last year, there was a very important paper which showed that the basic founder haplogroups, that is CDF, they are not present close to the Africa in the, for example, like if we should see a serial founder effect in the left side in the uh, A picture, the CDF should present into the Middle East are close to the African region. But what they have found that CDF were present into the East and Southeast Asia. What does it mean? It means that there was a rapid migration out of Africa and then these population have again dispersed from Southeast Asia or South Asian region to the rest part of the world. And it says that there is a Southeast Asian origin for present day non-African human Y chromosome. So all of the human Y chromosome has been originated either into Southeast Asia or in South Asia. Next, please. And here you see a very clear cut distribution. You do not see any, this the earliest founder lineages which are present into the any European population. They are mostly into the Himalayan region, mostly into the South Asian region, mostly into the Southeast Asian region. So it means that the basic founder haplogroups of non-African population, they have been originated into the East, not to the West. 
Next, please. And based on that, there is K star haplogroup, and K star haplogroup has given rise the the recent L T R Q N O, and these all they have either into the Southeast Asian region origin or South Asian region origin. Next, please. So, if we look to the India-wide pattern of haplogroups, we see that H is the largest haplogroup of India, which has originated into India. It is very high into the into the various groups into the south. Also, in several north group has this haplogroup high. There is haplogroup O, which is because of O3 and O2, which has been brought by Austroasiatic and Tibeto-Burman speakers. There is R2 10%. And R2 has highest diversity into the Orissa region, and even the pre-R2 is present into Orissa. And I would like to mention here that the Iranian farmer has the R2A haplogroup, which is connects which connects it with the Indian subcontinent. So there are several haplogroups. There are some major haplogroups, some minor haplogroups. So overall. Uh, there are most of the haplogroups of India are the one which are present into India, and some of them are shared between two population. So next, so if we look R one A and R two, you see that on the right side there is R two haplogroup. R two haplogroup is much more diverse, and the ancestral uh, branch is present into South Asia. Then R one A has clear cut Z ninety three differentiation. Between uh, other regions and South Asia has a very distinct pattern of uh, R1A haplogroup. So, in the next slide, there was a study by Silva et al. in 2017, which has showed that most of the R1A is present into non-South Asian region, and South Asia has a very recent branch. Whereas, when we have done our study, next please. We have found all the red dots is being harbored by South Asian population. So when you study a very narrow kind of population, then you cannot tell about South Asian population. One has to study large number of South Asian population, more than thousand individuals from a very diverse group. But not only caste population, one need to study the tribal population, and. When you study a large number of population, the scenario goes very, very different. And here you see that the, all the red dots is being represented by South Asian population, by South Asian individuals. So here I don't have to say that uh, the South Asian is not representing just a subset of R1A. They are spread everywhere into the R1A branch. Next, please. So here you see that on the the top M one seventy three is more than twenty thousand years older than seven seventeen thousand then five thousand then six thousand then again four thousand nine hundred four thousand nine hundred three thousand nine hundred so all the branches are present into South Asia on the left side I have mentioned this is northeast north south central all the region they have very deep lineages which has been uh, Uh, spread it from the group R1A, and more than 50% of the Indian R1A is being defined by M780. M780 is also present into the into the Gypsy population, the Roma population of Europe. And here you see that next piece, uh, the spatial and also the temporal distribution of M780 associated associated branches shows that it has locally originated. Into South Asia, and here, if you see in the picture on the top of the picture, the distribution shows that it is mostly present into the Gangetic Plain region, and the diversity of this group, if we measure, then it is more higher to the central part of India, not to the northwest part of India. So, next, please. And here you see the distribution of these groups are very, very distinct, and mostly the even the south. Indian, they have a lot of M seven eight zero branches, the the maroon color branches, and it is present into all the regions of India. That shows that this haplogroup is not very recently intruded, very recently uh, entered to India, but it is 
it's expanding since several thousand years back and the str diversity is much more higher into the central part of india not to the northwestern part of india from where they say that people have migrated so wherever the the the, the migration would have happened they should have the higher frequency or the higher diversity but this was not present into the into the indian samples so we see that it has in situ differentiated into the indian subcontinent so next please and so far we lack the ancient dna from south asia we need real solid ancient dna from the uh, from the gangetic plain because gangetic plain is one of the major important uh, role player in the in the population history of south asia and recently there was one more paper from the archaeologist and they said that the even the population of gangetic plain has lived more than 50 more than 70000 years back so the population which were present in the gangetic plain they are also living there since several hundred thousand years back it means that the initial peopling of india was either in south or in north there is no differentiation and the group they were present into the north as well as in south india so in this picture it's it's uh, not visible that what haplogroups the, the colors are visible but the names the haplogroup the labelings are not visible but here you see that there were 57 samples from swathpally and there is only 5% of uh, them they they were uh, as r1a and there was a very bizarre statement from the authors they said that because the in swat valley the migration the aryan migration was female mediated the females has migrated but males less male has migrated which is very unlikely because in aryan uh, movement like what has happened in europe there was a massive migration from step belt but this kind of migration is completely absent into the south asian population and for possibly the ancestry which is present into some of the south asian population it has came very late to the to through the different routes and through the different migration as we can see in the roar case into some of the uh, population studies which we have done recently next please so i would like to acknowledge several collaborators from all over the world because they provide the and power they provide the samples they provide uh, several discussions and several funding agencies for that and what we see that still the picture is not very clear the south asian population this is everybody accepts that the south asian population has very autochthonous maternal ancestry now the question is goes to the paternal ancestry now everyone focuses on haplogroup r1a but we see that the major branches of haplogroup r1a more than 90% of haplogroup r1a has origin which has only happened into this subcontinent not outside of the subcontinent so this is how the we are moving further with the technological ad advancement and soon we will be sequencing some of the ancient samples from gangetic plain and i think those samples would be very much uh, worthwhile would be very much useful to understand the initial peopling of india and what was the impact if if there is any kind of uh, rn gene influx and when it has happened and how this uh, step related ancestry which is still 10% 5% 25% in some population but mostly 10% overall how it has entered to the indian subcontinent this we were able to know so thank you very much next please next slide so so far based on the various studies we have done and studies done by others we see that there is a genetic unity we all are we all indians are uh, embedded in one thread one thread connects us all and this thread is is two ancestries one is the harappan related ancestry which is present among all of the indian population and second ancestry 
his ancestral South Asian ancestry, the hunting, hunting gathering ancestry that is also present among all of the population of South Asia. So we have ER divers because we are living more than 74,000 years in the same subcontinent. But what binds us together is the common genetic trait, the common genetic ancestry. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your understanding. And I'm very sorry for the problems in the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ganeshwarji, that was a very enlightening presentation. And uh, now we will open the floor for questions. So you can raise your hand uh, uh, in your, there is a hand, uh, this thing in your uh, chat window. And I will ask the questions uh, sequentially. Uh, please keep your questions short. Uh, Parnaji, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Chauve. This was an amazing talk. There was just so much material. I think you can give multiple talks on this. Uh, so I, I had uh, two questions, actually. The first one was uh, for the uh, slide that you showed with Pathak et al. 2018 about the 50 generations where you have different uh, communities uh, and the uh, mixtures there. I was very intrigued to see that the Gujarati was the only one which did not have any Dravidian uh, or any other mixture in it. So I, uh, if you could please comment on that. So that was my first question. And the second question was, uh, can you comment a little bit on the H13 maternal DNA uh, origin, uh, just because it happens to be mine? Thank you very yeah, much. Right. So, so in, in those cases, this was the ancestry which, was, which were differentiated based on some of the common SNPs which were present into South India, into the North India, into the Europe, into the other parts of the world. So when we look to the North Indian ancestry, it means the overall most of the North Indian population, they would carry this North Indian ancestry. There is a minor ancestry, which is, uh, which is also present into among them. And that is also South, South Indian ancestry, but mostly most of the Indian population, if they live in North, they would have North Indian related ancestry. And this North Indian related ancestry is mostly related with the Harappan ancestry. And second one, the H14 uh, haplogroup, which is our maternal haplogroup. This is not paternal haplogroup. So the maternal haplogroup is shared between European population and South Asian population. And that is more than 20,000 years older. So wherever we see the mitochondrial DNA ancestry, except for some of the haplogroups like W3, and some uh, H4. Otherwise, most of the haplogroup are shared between, if they shared between South Asia and Europe, they are more than 15 to 20,000 years old. Uh, Imran Patel Ji, if you want to ask a question. Uh, yeah, please. Thanks. Um, so uh, I listened to most of this discussion and um, I think uh, he, uh, this is consistent with uh, a lot of analysis that I've done. Uh, I'm mostly looking at um, uh, this Rike Lab admix tools, looking at F3, F4 stats and PCAs. Um, if you look at the PCA of South Asians and West Eurasians and the uh, East Asians, it, it looks like the South, uh, the West Eurasians are kind of uh, separating from South Asia. So a lot of analysis that I've done, it looks like the South Asians are the origin of West Eurasians, and then the A&E and kind of Southwest Asians, the Iran N, are separating from South Asians. And what you say about the STR diversity of uh, the Y-DNA is, um, I agree with that, but I think in the Northwest, what's happening is because these guys were kind of the Aryans, they were very warlike people, I think they lost a lot of diversity and maybe it's been pushed East and West. So maybe in the East, you got more diversity, but in the Northwest region, if they were very competitive and kind of um, uh, warlike people, they may have pushed people out. So some of the diversity in the Northwest could have been lost. But I think the the most of the diversity is in maybe uh, Uttar Pradesh. There's a lot of diversity there as well. So I think a lot of it is consistent. But I've been having a theory that South Asian is the kind of origin of, of, of Eurasian DNA. So I think a lot of this is consistent. Um, yeah, I don't know what you think about that. 
Madam, thanks for your comments. You, you know, still we need a lot of uh, samples from Dingeti plain that uh, I had mentioned before. And some of the ancient sample from South Asia is needed. As you know, that in 2008, there was a paper which said that more than half of the humanity 25,000 years back lived in either in South Asia or in Southeast Asia. So this is the region where most of the effective population size was very high. Most of the population has lived. Then when you have full of the people in your, uh, in your region or in your country, then there is no way that some five or 10 people just could come and then uh, they, they change the whole scenario, which is almost impossible. And we have seen into the history as well. Like there were few people, they came, but they have not changed our DNA. Like uh, during the, uh, the colonial regime, during the, the Muslim invasion, we don't see that people came to us, but they did not change our genomic ancestry. And uh, possibly you are true, but still we need a lot of data. We need a lot of new samples to identify this. And this is possible. I, I completely agree with you. Agnal, please go ahead. Uh, hi, a couple of questions. So first one is, um, um, so with this proposed uh, model, would you say the Rocky Gargi, Rocky Gargi uh, sample is the outlier? And, uh, and is there any DNA extracted from the Sonali uh, uh, skeletons? And the third one is, um, is a G1, is that highly diverse or is there any uh, ancestry in South Asia or like India from G1? Um, th those are the three questions. So, so you are asking about why haplogroup J1? G, G1, G. Z G as in uh, your name, Nyaneshwar. Oh, G1. No, yeah. no, there is no G. Actually, this is very infrequent in South Asia. We don't see several G samples. And uh, Probably the G is uh, more related with West Eurasia, not with uh, South Asia. And uh, maybe we need some of the complete sequences related with the uh, haplogroup G, which if so far we could see some of the samples, but this is very infrequent in South Asia, as far as I know, as far as we have found in our studies. Okay, I, I'm G1B, that's what I was asking. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, so, so yeah. uh, if, if you have sequenced your sample, we, we recently sequencing some of the samples which are very rare and which has found into India, like some R1B and some G and some uh, other, uh, for example, like J1. So uh, maybe you can just drop us an email and we could look your sample as well. Yeah, and, sure. And there, There is a question I would like to take it. This is a very interesting question, which says that parental haplogroup of R1A M780, that is R1A Z93, is found in ancient DNA from step dated around 4000 BC. Then we can say that R1A Z93 were brought by the immigrants into India, which later mutated to M780. This is one of the scenario, but there is one more scenario which could be other way around as well. And this M780 origin is something like 4,900 years. So that goes beyond to the timeline, which is 3,500 years ago. So, but there is just one branch and it is so much successful, like 19% of the South Asian and these 19% overall has more than 50% M780. It means there you need a lot of like a uh, successful, uh, like for example, like a Genghis Khan kind of event, but that event has not been seen for M780. We see a very clear cut climb and very clear cut differentiation of the various branches of M780, which is completely different from the Genghis Khan kind of event. So otherwise, if we say that there is R star in India, there is R1A star in India, Z93 star in India. So the diverse group which are present into India, it's really difficult to ascertain that whether they came from outside a different timeline or they just went from here to outside. But I think slowly, slowly we would be able to know if we sequence more and more samples. Thank you. 
आनंद जी प्लीज गो है नमस्कार एम आई ऑडिबल यस यस थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर लुसिड प्रेजेंटेशन आई हैव टू क्वेश्चन वन इज इज इट नॉट द राइट टाइम टू यूटिलाइज इंडियन वोकेबुलरी लाइक राधर दैन सेंग साउथ एशियन द इंडियन सबकॉन्टिनेंट राधर दैन सेंग अरेबिक सी सिंधु सागर एंड सो ऑन बिकॉज नाउ आई बिलीव अ लॉट ऑफ मटेरियल इज फ्रॉम अवर साइड so the changing the vocabulary to our area like we call it middle east when we are looking from europe so that is right. the first part mm -hmm. the second part is uh, does your uh, research throw up any genetic dip between 5000 to 6000 years before christ i am right. referring specifically to mahabharat war yes i i agree with you and uh, i think we should slowly start to change this uh, this terminology so better south asia is better to call as indian subcontinent and we have used in some of the papers as indian subcontinent and uh, he, there's another question he was asking about uh, whether he, uh, is there any research 5000 years before christ for india in india yeah Uh, not not really this is our problem and uh, but i think slowly within couple of years we will have uh, some of the data from you know the indian uh, uh, the indian uh, climate is not so good to preserve the ancient samples and this is uh, our main problem otherwise we could have already solved this uh, lot of problems which has been uh, killing us since 150 1150 years yeah there's a couple of questions in the chat window uh, which says that ir about iranian farmer related population and there is one about bengali speaking people yeah. so let me uh, yes we we should expect ancient human samples we are trying to isolate from several this kind of uh, samples but still we are not uh, i mean uh, our data is not so good to to make it to public or to publish it but with the technological advancement we could uh, able to produce it within couple of years so yogesh r has a question when the iranian farmer related population origin when or where so when and when it's like iranian farmer related population is something like 10000 years and where it is a big question that where it has originated some of them say that it has originated into the more to the uh, to the indus region than to the iranian region but this is still a big question how it is genetically related to anatolian farmers the anatolian farmers they have some genetic ancestry but not very i mean not they don't so they don't share too much genetic ancestry and ancestral aasi is like the ancestral south asian ancestry which is south asian hunting gathering population and i think uh, the problem is if we get some south asian real hunting gathering sample and chain sample here using uh, onge as a uh, representative of aasi i think i mean to me it doesn't work very well and we need some ancient sample from that and many of the questions and many of the ancestries would be solved if we get the real aasi samples and probably some of the group i am not very sure they are working on sri lankan ancient sample which is more than 45000 years older and if we get dna out of that then uh, i think it will be very very useful so what is the genealogy of bengali speaking people bengali speaking people uh you know it's it's uh, uh, really interesting that uh, they are divided into several groups as many of the indian population and the tribal population and the east and west bengal population east and west bengal has very unique kind of ancestry which is more related with the northern indian population and even in bengalis you see the several groups the brahmins have different ancestry they are more related with the brahmins other group of brahmins but then the 
there are uh, kayast bengalis they are more related with the central indian population so they are they are very very much diverse and we cannot just put one single line or single uh, ancestry uh, which can demarcate each and every bengali speaking individual so thank you question for a lot of data we can uh, we can uh, discuss about it and then uh, we can uh, also go together thank you very much there is a question about dwij gotra and haplographs yes how distinct are dwij gotra and haplographs there is one more question before that i am asking about genetic dip so oh. this genetic dip uh, has happened for the y chromosome if you see the carmin our paper carmin et al in 2015 there there is a genetic dip which has happened 8000 to 4000 years back and initially when we have analyzed the data we thought that this is because of mahabharata event but this was present everywhere even in africa and there was no mahabharata in africa so there is some kind of cultural shift for the population and this cultural shift has created this genetic dip so this genetic dip doesn't relate with the with the effective population size of females but it does relate with the effective population size of male and the gotra is another uh, problem another question we are working uh, believe me when i started working in genetics i started with the gotra system i am still working on it something like 15 years have been passed but still we, <laughs> we are trying to find out the complexity of the gotra so gotra what we understood out of it just in few lines that the gotra is like a school of thought for example like if i start a school of mind and then i call several people from several haplo groups and then they use my name just to use as a gotra so what we see that each and every gotra has a group of haplo groups but this haplo group is like having a distinct kind of pattern like gotra x and gotra y will have also haplo group x and y but this x and y haplo group they do not match they are very distinct from each other so this gotra uh, i think uh, within a year we will be able to publish more and more on this gotra system and uh, and but mostly with the brahmin gotra system because this is very fascinating and i think the gotra system is much more older than the caste system and it has originated at least 4000 years back or even more older how distinct also why, when did they segregate in the timeline yeah so i explained you this uh, the the gotra system but i think uh, here i'm not completely uh like uh, depend on the data but whatever we see on the data i was able to explain you but i think uh, in future there will be more and more uh, information about the gotra system any update on the sonoli sonoli dna sample as far as because i am not directly involved there dr neeraj rai is involved there and he said that the quality is not so good but they are trying again to reamplify it and uh, we hope that uh, we get something out of it and when the data will come i will be able to know that uh, how they are falling and how they are related with uh, rakhi gadi sample but i think there are they are they will be more related with the rakhi gadi samples and their uh, uh, their uh, sharing of the dna component they will have rakhi gadi uh, ancestry they will have also gangetic plain related ancestry that we will be able to know after the analysis so what is the likely origin of m207 we find all the downstream clades that is r1a r2 r1b in india but r2 is probably absent in both ancient and modern europe likely origin yes uh, this is also my assumption that uh, m207 as you see that most of the basic haplogroup which has given rise overall the the west eurasian or even non african lineages they all have origin to the east either to the south asia or to the southeast asia so probably 207 has originated most likely into the uh, into the region which is more towards east not towards west but so far in our data what we have gathered from at least r1a 
the R1A star, M173 stars are very prominent, very nicely present into the Himalayan region. So based on that, we are going to mention that probably it has originated, the R1A at least originated into the vicinity of Himalaya. So more questions. Oh, the horse DNA, uh, I think uh, people are working on it, but I think still, you know, uh, I'm very sorry to say that we are still far, far away to solve this problem. And uh, it might take more years, but please be here with us. Uh, if, uh, if they, like, uh, if our health and everything will be good, we would be able to crack many of the problems. So some endogamous, do we have horse DNA? So horse DNA is still going on. I don't have any information. If I would have, I would definitely share with you. And some endogamous communities like Arya, Vyasa have last, last admixture. Yes, that's true. Something 2000 BC, can we say caste system started? Yes, this is also my, my opinion. The caste system is uh, something like, uh, more than 4,000 years older. And during the same time, the Gotra system has originated. And we see that both of the time has, are completely uh, in synchronization. So uh, you are very much right, and I completely agree with you. Is RY6 derived from our R1A? What is this RY6? I don't know about this RY6. Is that some branch of group R1A? Srini Rao. Uh, there's a question to me. It says, how do your samples compare with Indian samples in Y full? I don't know what that means. Yes. Okay. So Y full is like uh, the sample, which is uh, more from the population who is living outside of India. So this is mostly the caste population who live out of India. They have given their sample to the private companies. They have seen their sample for their own interest, but these samples do not represent the real Indian population. The real Indian population has a lot to do with the various lower caste population, where various higher caste population, various tribal population. So the Y full do not represent the overall picture. It cannot capture the overall picture of South Asia or, or Indian subcontinent. So uh, Y full is, is like a subset and uh, uh, still we need to sequence several Indian population to have a real picture of the Y chromosome in Indian subcontinent. So Yanishwari, is there you know, a lab to... in India where people can get their genetic test done or? No, it can be done freely to our lab, but it takes it takes time because uh, we get the funding from the government and uh, usually government do not pay for such things. So if we run like 10, 20 samples from some population, we just add additionally a few of the sample from the, from the private people and uh, we can tell their result free of cost. We don't uh, charge anything. Okay. And if you, if someone wants to visit to India, then uh, they can visit to our lab and uh, they can give their samples. Uh, but at least six months, they have to provide us to, to get their data. We are not so fast and we don't have so much funds to, to, to entertain people. Uh, this community is, uh, and the ancient caste system starting around uh, 2000 BC. Now, uh, when rather than using the word caste system, I would say the Varna system. And right. uh, the Varna system was also mentioned within the Mahabharata. Uh, you know, the Krishna has talked about, you know, it's like not by based on your birth, more about your karma and your gunas. So right. considering that the Mahabharata's date in itself can be disputed or is, you know, there, are, you know, works, there, there is work going on as to the actual timeline and there are some timelines presented already. So the question I have is like, you know, the solidification in the sense that, uh, you know, it is ossified into the society. And was it like around this time or was it like, you know, you know, when, when, when you have, uh, uh, when you have uh, like somebody saying like, you know, the, 
system can be fluid in a sense that it depends on your karma and your gunas. So that is one aspect, but solidification where the, you know, you are forced to do what you are, you know, based on what you are doing or what your ancestors were doing. So is that the time when, when you say it's 2000 years BC, it was that like, or even 100 CE, was that the exact timeline? Is, is no, 100 CE is too, too, too early, I mean, too, too late. Uh, we don't see any such kind of uh, differentiation in the caste. But uh, let's say like 70 to 100 generation is the time when the caste group started to follow a very strict endogamous type of marriages. And like if you divide, if, if you multiply this with, with 30, so it means 30 into 100, something like 3000 years is the time when everyone, each and every group of India has started practicing a very strict endogamy practices. It does not mean that caste system has started during this time. Caste system would be much more older because the Rig Veda says that the, as you said, the based on occupation, people has been divided into different caste group and uh, Lord Krishna has also talked about it. So possibly the caste system is much more older, but the strict endogamy has probably happened three to 4,000 years back. Uh, Ganeshwar ji, I think we have, uh, uh, we have uh, reached our time limit. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, conversation and uh, the, we have gained a lot of knowledge and especially about this Aryan and Dravidian and North and South divide. So thank you for uh, giving your time and presenting this presentation.